okay? <laughs> with a few questions. How is it possible for someone in New Jersey to help someone he's never met in Tennessee get a health insurance agent in Orange County, California in just a few minutes? And how is it possible for every person in this room to give the same quality customer service that Nordstrom gives to their clients? And how is it possible for one woman in Washington, D.C. to share information on women's entrepreneur events around the world to over 277,000 people with just a few clicks of the keyboard? The answer is social media. My name is David Deutsch. My company is Synergy Social. We do social media strategy for clients who are frightened by Facebook, terrified of Twitter, or lost on LinkedIn. And today we are going to... I'll be here all night, folks. Standing room only. We're going to talk today about what social media is, what it isn't, and how it can help you meet your specific business objectives. Okay? I think it's important to really establish what this social media thing is. How did we get here? You hear the term a lot these days, but you don't maybe necessarily know what it is. Let's establish what this thing is. It actually started in the 1960s. It was a joint project between the Rand Corporation, MIT, and Caltech. At the time, computers were uh, bigger than this room and not as powerful as our current calculators. And these guys in the 60s said, let's have these computers talk to each other. That's the beginning of the internet. Back then, it wasn't called the internet. I'm sorry? <laughs> well, that's an, I'm going to get there in a second. I'm getting there. The thing was, after, after they uh, found out about this, the Department of Defense heard about it and said, ooh, we can use this to blow things up. I'll oh, set your phasers to stun, please, everybody, if you wouldn't mind. They could say you could use it to blow things up, so they went ahead and took it and called ARPANET and DARPANET back in the 1960s. By the 1980s, legislation was passed by, yes, Senator Al Gore, that allowed ARPANET and DARPANET to be accessed by the general public. Back then, it was just called the Internet. But yes, Senator Al Gore actually was recently nominated to the um, Internet Hall of Fame for allowing this to actually happen. So he didn't invent the Internet. He didn't even say he invented the Internet, but he did take the initiative in creating what we now know as the Internet. In 1991, this man, a name named Tim Berners-Lee, is a nice guy. I actually met him once. He wrote the code for the World Wide Web. A lot of people use the terms Internet and World Wide Web synonymously. They're not the same thing. The internet is the computers talking to each other, and the World Wide Web is the code that allows you to access the internet. So it's actually a code. He wrote it on the back of an envelope. He talked a very funny story about how he wrote it on the back of an envelope and showed his boss, and his boss goes, interesting, but I don't know what to do with it. That's how it all started, in the back of an envelope, a little bit of code written down. By the year 2000, 360 million people were on the World Wide Web. And by the year uh, 2010, it was 1.9 billion. <laughs> so it's pretty phenomenal growth pretty quickly. But that wasn't supposed to happen, was it? Because we had the dot-com bubble burst. Remember in 2000, everyone said, oh, this internet thing is a big fad, and it's not going anywhere. And people couldn't find jobs, right? Everyone was out of work. So no one really knew what to do. But in 2000, but the internet kept growing. The World Wide Web use kept growing. Why? How is it possible after the dot-com bubble burst that the internet keeps growing. Well, this, another Tim, his name Tim O'Reilly. Uh, incidentally, if your name's Tim, you probably have a pretty good chance of doing well in this field. What is about Tim's? I don't know. But Tim O'Reilly, in 2004, hosted what's called the Web 2.0 Conference. He got like-minded entrepreneurs together and assessed what kinds of websites were growing in spite of the dot-com bubble bursting and why. And they noticed certain characteristics of certain sites, like Flickr. Flickr is a photo sharing site. The old way of doing the internet is you would take pictures on vacation, email them to your friends, or maybe put them on your website, and everyone would say, oh, that's so great. Flickr is a third-party photo sharing site where people can upload their pictures and the whole world can comment on your photos. Your photos became a social thing, hence the term social media. So those were the kinds of characteristics of the websites that were growing. Now, the truth be told, if you feel like this, you're not alone. Should we turn the lights off, by the way? Would that be more helpful? Is that helpful? Is that, that better? <laughs> Shot them all? OK. Yes, sir. I don't know how. OK. So if you guys feel like this, there's a reason. We all feel like this. Anyone? I've been using social media for nearly nine years now. And I am still, everyone, frankly, has more questions than answers about this stuff. That's the truth. So if you're overwhelmed, it's not just you. We all are. However, I believe I've gotten the core of social media down to two words, interactivity and narcissism. <laughs> okay. So in terms of interactivity, 
there are two things you have to remember here. There's speaking and listening. People oftentimes think of social media as a place to update your status. It is that. But the real power is the capacity to listen and not to speak. There's real power in listening to social conversations and not saying a thing. And I'm going to demonstrate to you today how that works and how, how you can actually use strategic social media listening to grow your business. Now, in terms of narcissism, I'm always very sorry to bring Paris Hilton into the room. However, there's an important point to be made here. I am not a sports fan. Right? If you talk to me about baseball or football, you're going to lose me. I just don't care. Right? I am, however, a social media junkie. If I were to talk to you and you weren't interested in social media, I would use you. I would lose you, right? So you always have to remember your audience. You have to remember that your audience, everyone has an inherent self-interest in the topics. And you've got to give your audience what they want and capitalize on the little Paris Hilton that I think all of us really have, right? So I want you to think of your website as your workplace and social media as the bar after work, OK? This is not marketing. From now on, I want you to stop saying social media marketing. It's not marketing. It's a conversation. And I want you to think of this in terms of having a conversation with people and not marketing yourself. Because if you're at that bar after work and you start marketing yourself, you're going to be lonely at the bar. Right? So where do you begin with this stuff? First, you've got to ask the right question. Right? That's the first thing you have to do. A lot of people think the right question is how do we use social media? This is actually the wrong question to ask. The right question to ask is what are our objectives and how can social media get us there? Oh, by the way, these little sheets I handed out on the back side is just blank for notes if you want to take notes. Sorry, I didn't type that earlier. So this is the question you got to ask yourself. What are our strategic business objectives and how do we get there? More customers? Improve reputation, improved customer service. Those are business objectives. Engagement and likes on your Facebook page is not an objective. An objective is growing your business, increasing your sales. Since we have limited time, I can't really talk about my specific process, and, uh, but I want to just go ahead and talk about some basic rules of social media, some of the sort of norms that are out there, right? So one rule I came up with is called the 595 rule. 5% of your content on social media and no more should be about your products and services, events, and items about your business. No more than 5% should be about you. 95% of your content should be listening to conversations, engaging in conversations, gathering and sharing information, asking and answering questions, and providing thought leadership and sharing what you've learned. This is the power here. This is why it's not marketing. Because if you talk about yourself, on this stuff, you're going to be really, people are going to be annoyed and they're going to unfriend you or stop following you. You don't want to talk about yourself here. I also came up with an acronym, CURE, stands for Compelling, Useful, Relevant, and Educational. Make sure the content you provide is useful for your audience. I mentor a bunch of entrepreneur startups at a place called Tech Launch. It's a high-tech accelerator. One of the kids came to me. He's doing low-cost travel website. And he, I said, who's your audience? This was two weeks ago. He said, who's your audience? I, he said, college students. I said, what do college students want? He said, free food. I said, give them that. He said, why? What does that have to do with buses? I said, nothing. But it's what your audience wants. So they're going to tell all their friends to come and like your page. Then they're going to look up and go, oh, cheap travel too. It's a really different mindset you have to take that has nothing to do with you. It's compelling, useful, relevant, educational for your audience, right? And you want to encourage interaction. You don't want to put people to sleep, right? You want to say, here's something that you, that you would like. What are your thoughts? Create interaction. Create engagement with people. Have them have conversations with you. Hi, get them a sandwich. No problem. How much time do you spend on this stuff? I came up with something called the rule of threes. 30 minutes a day, three times a week, just to get started. If you're overwhelmed, you don't know where to start, just start here with 30 minutes a day, three times a week. Set an egg timer. After 30 minutes, ding, stop. And that way you're not overwhelmed. That's an hour and a half a week to get started. Right? And also, you want to analyze your data. So once you gather data, you want to actually analyze it. There are many, many ways to analyze your data. One's called Radiant 6. It's a quite expensive social media listening tool, but I'm going to show you in a little bit how Radiant 6 works. 
It's a subscription service. There are free ways to listen. Uh, Bitly is a, and WordPress are ways to analyze your links. It helps you track uh, how many clicks are there, you're getting through, and so on. It's pretty basic analytics, but Radian 6 is an amazing tool, if a bit expensive. It's low and 600 a month to subscribe to, but it does amazing stuff. It does amazing stuff. And so I hear also, I hear four common concerns about social media over and over again. I want to address them with you because you may have the same concerns, right? What's my ROI? What's my return on my investment? What about privacy and security? I'm not allowed to share or I don't want to share stuff. And updates are annoying. Each of these is legitimate and real and I want to address each of them. First, what's my ROI? How am I going to determine my return on my investment? Wrong metric. It's really return on ROR. Not return on investment, return on relationships. <coughs> Right? You want to have and maintain and sustain relationships with people online. They trust you, then they're going to want to do business with you because they trust that you know what you're talking about because you've created thought leadership through your social media. Right? By not talking about yourself, you're creating this relationship. <laughs> you know, you, think of what's happening here. He's created a relationship with his dog. He's given his dog what he wants. That's the kind of relationship you want. You want to give your audience what they want. Right? Privacy and security. I hear this a lot and it's a legitimate concern. Uh, by, by a show of hands, who drove here today? Okay, I heard that there was a fatal accident today on 287. Over 30,000 people die on our roads every single year. If this were a plague, we'd be quarantined as a country. And yet, we still drive. Why? Because we know we can't hide under our beds, right? So what do we do? We wear our seatbelts, right? We, have airbags. My car has so many airbags, if I got into an accident, I'll be the boy in the bubble. Right? right? You obey traffic signals. There's no way to fully protect yourself in anything you do. But you can take steps to mitigate your risk on social media and when you're driving and so on and so forth. 